violation of that. <laughs> oh, there are stairs. Hello. <laughs> I just, I prefer to have the mic, but if you all think it's too loud, just let me know. Um, so I'm Blanca Torres. I work for KQED. I am a producer for Forum, which is the daily morning talk show. And I also do reporting for our newsroom and recently launched a new newsletter for KQED called Que Onda, and it's specifically catering to the Latino community here in the Bay Area. So I got to do a lot of things at KQED. So I'm very pleased to be here with all of you. Um, one of the reasons I ended up um, you know, within the Huckleberry, I guess, um, network is because I did some reporting on mental health a couple years ago. I did a project on kids and mental health and just um, the lack of access to services and um, you know, the, the rising numbers, which we will talk about very soon. So that's kind of my interest in, in mental health. And so we have a really great panel with us, really amazing expertise here. Um, we have Madeline Levine. She is a psychologist with close to 40 years of experience, a clinician, consultant, educator. She wrote a best-selling book called Ready or Not, Preparing Our Kids to Thrive in an Uncertain and Rapidly Changing World. So welcome, Madeline. We also have Doug Stiles, who many of you know. He's the executive director and CEO of Huckleberry Youth Programs. He is also has a background in psychology. And before coming to Huckleberry Youth Programs, he served as the clinical director and associate director for Star Vista, which is a multi-service nonprofit in San Mateo County. And we also have Courtney Johnson who is an associate marriage and family therapist in the Huckleberry Advocacy and Response Team. She's working very closely with youth and we'll be talking about her experiences. So we have a really great array of just knowledge and expertise here tonight. So, um, you know, we wanted to make this conversation as interesting and useful for you all. So um, we do have time at the end for question and answer, but Sometimes as you know, panelists are speaking, you might think of a question, so we're a small group, so feel free to raise your hand to ask a question at any time. Um, but we, we just like to start out talking about kind of where we're at with youth mental health right now. Um, you know, there's been some kind of alarming statistics that have come out if you watch the news or listen to forum, we've done shows on this. Um, but. You know, the CDC reported um, from 2016 to 2019, for 12 to 17-year-olds, 15% had a major depressive episode, 37% had persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness, and 19% seriously considered attempting suicide. And that was before the pandemic. And we've just heard, you know, it takes a while for stats to catch up, but we've just heard that's gotten worse and worse for, for young people. And, um, you know, I'm a parent, my children are five and seven, so, um, you know, I'm really interested in this as someone who <laughs> wants my children to grow up with great mental health. Um, but so I'd like each of the panelists to just kind of talk about, um, you know, how, how they're seeing these trends play out in their work and just how they kind of characterize what's going on. Um, so... Yes, just talk to us about what you're seeing. So let's start with Madeline, since since you're right next to me. <laughs> um, 
It should be Hello? on. Yes. Yeah. Okay, it's on. Um, so I, I, I'm going to take a particular point of view. I've been a psychologist for over 40 years, so that makes me very old. Um, and um, we were running into a mental health crisis before the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, things really accelerated and got worse. Nobody has good numbers on post-pandemic yet because it's, we don't have enough time. The numbers did not go up terribly much. They went up some, um, and I think there was an awful lot of reporting about the crisis that was um, frightening. I think the, the, the pandemic did particular things in terms of mental health. It increased isolation and it decreased connection. And those are two really big things. So the kids, I'll tell you a little story. I, during the pandemic, so we're all in our house. I can't see kids in my office. So I see them in this little garden I have outside with a mask and, you know. and. Um, so many kids wanted to be seen, which I, you know I just couldn't do. So I had to figure out how to like triage a little bit. So I decided that all these kids were coming. I'm so depressed, and I can't see my friends, and I'm not going to graduate. And th they became incredibly self-absorbed uh, and very sad and very disengaged. And so the only way I could think of managing the caseload was to say, "I'm willing to see you if you're willing to do some service." And I have learned more from that interaction than all my years of education, which was the most important thing you can do for the type of kids I was seeing was to engage them with some sense of purpose. And uh, I don't know if you know a guy named Bill Damon. He's down in at Stanford. And he says, and I, I agree with him, that as much as stress is a problem, I have a school reform project down at Stanford, the bigger problem is, uh, is meaninglessness, and, and that's what I'm finding. Thank you. That's my workout for the day. <laughs> I'm getting the mic out. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Yes. <laughs> um, so, Adolescence is, is the period of identity development. It's where young people are in between childhood and adulthood, and they're both figuring out who they are and who they are is being figured out through their peers and people around them. And during the pandemic, we had this... Um, everything was coming together in a bad way for, for adolescents. Um, social media started to grow. Um, even more than it was before that. Um, during the pandemic, people were online instead of in classrooms, so social engagement wasn't happening uh, with adolescents. Um, schools were shut down, so there wasn't the broader socialization that happens in sports or on the, on the, the playground or after school. Um, and the, the combination of all these things together, I think, has made us, uh, or has, has uh, helped us enter into this kind of new realm of what does mental health even mean for adolescents. Uh, we hear more people talk about a pandemic of loneliness, as, as you were mentioning, whereas before we were talking about major depression and general anxiety. We're now talking about these other terms that are pervasive um, that uh, adolescents are showing up with. And we don't know um, all that we can do to change this because it's systemic. It's we're seeing, we're seeing anyway at Huckleberry more and more people with pervasive loneliness, um, with uh, anxiety. That's that's I wouldn't call it clinical anxiety. That's really um, debilitating, but it's happening every day, and people are more um, more anxious. I would say in just their regular life. So a lot of things that came together during the pandemic that made it really challenging to be an adolescent. And um, we're not out of it. It's, it's still happening. Um, so that's where I think we are. <laughs> um, so I think it's interesting when I was 
coming out of grad school, I worked in 2020, the school year of 2021, 2022 in a middle school. And um, everybody was, you know, coming back. They were trying to get clubs going, trying to get kids to socialize. But there was just, it was, there was such a loss of like so much developmental growth around like how to even socialize and like I think of like my clients now who are graduating this year and they went into the pandemic in 2020 or in freshman year in 20 they were freshmen in 2020 and um there was there's just so many things I think for a lot of the kids that or a lot of the youth that I work with there was housing instability that was something that became like a extreme stressor an extreme source of anxiety um problems at home were there wasn't even an opportunity for them to really be brought to the forefront in the way that like we hope that we can work with families but when everybody's kind of stuck in the same house and you know struggling <coughs> in so many different ways um it's there it it's so hard to even like jump in where we're at now I think without going backwards and like really building what I think is what I see most of and that I've done the most work on in the last like couple of years, I would say is like around socializing, social skills. How do I make friends? How do I talk to people? How do I put myself out there when, you know, for a year, two years, three years, there was just so much sadness and loneliness and um, it's, you know, p humans, I think, are resilient to a certain extent, and youth definitely are, and at the same time, it, it was something that nobody had a plan for, and kids need, like, plans, structure, guidance, and when the adults in their lives didn't even have a plan, like, how were they supposed to know what to do? So... Um, it's, it's an interesting time. So Doug, you mentioned how, you know, there's anxiety, there's clinical anxiety. So one thing I think might be helpful is, can you talk about sort of different, I guess, conditions that affect young people? You know, we hear about depression and anxiety a lot, um, or just like emotional issues. So how do you kind of distinguish all of this, those things? Um, that, that's a great question because I think, and we'll, maybe we'll talk about social media. Social media has conflated um, clinical diagnoses with life. And so if you um, have a bad day, or I think it was, you know, what's the difference between emotional problems and mental illness? That's a big difference between emotional problems and mental illness. When you said kids weren't prepared, nobody was prepared, including the therapists who were making up go do service. I mean, we, we were all skating at that point. And so I, I, I think part of what happened was the reliance on social media and the newspapers. You know, every headline was crisis and stuff like that. So um, it was a crisis, uh, it, it was poorly defined, but we know what makes something a mental illness, and that's um, the amount of time is important, the severity is important, and the interference with life is important. Everybody here must have sad days, and if you don't, come talk to me afterwards. So <laughs> I wanna know what drug you're on. Um, <laughs> Everybody has sad days, everybody has jazzed up days, everybody has a range of feelings, and I think, I think there's a lot of pathologizing of the sort of normal parts of life. Um, if they're not really interfering, you know, the, the DSM says it's gotta be two weeks of like laying in bed. You, you can't just say oh, it's a crappy day, but mm -hmm there are criteria for mental illness um, that are quite stringent. The, the only part that I would add is what, what we're seeing is more people who are 
sadder or longer than the, what we call a regular or, or pre-pandemic, we would say is kind of a normal trajectory of, of, of sadness. There's, there's a recovery that's not happening uh, that's confounding. And I would not call it a mental illness, but that you want to, what I would say is think about what is the impact? How is it impacting your life? And if it's impacting your life, then that's something you need to get checked out and, and talk to someone about, even if it's not a, a diagnosable mental illness. Um, and, and it goes back to what you were saying about socialization. I think young people are having more difficulty navigating their own emotions and, uh, and that because they, they skipped that stage or didn't get to have that stage in terms of their development. And so um, they're, they're coming in with pervasive sadness, which is different than depression. Um, they, How? But, How is it different? I, I would say severity and, uh, and it, people are getting out of bed and they're going to school, but they can't find anything enjoyable in their life. So that's different than uh, um, I, it, my life's worthless and I'm not getting out of bed. And so, so it's, it's a level of severity, uh, but it's still impactful. It's still um, serious. And if it's not addressed, what happens then is the big question. I just want to add something to that, which is, you know, you made the point that this is a change. So in, in all the years that I used to work with teenagers, I would ask them to prioritize what mattered most to them in adolescence. And it was always autonomy and um, separation from family. And I would throw in isolation, something like that, just as a third option. And for years, nobody chose isolation. And for the last four years, everybody chooses isolation. Every time I've done one of these things, isolation is, lo or loneliness, depending which word I use, is, is the top thing. So that is very different. And I think we are still trying to figure out what to do about it. That was great. I don't know if I have anything to add. OK. <laughs> Well, let's talk then about social media, which plays a huge role in how young people are, you know, just experiencing so many things. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because we hear different things about social media. Like some people just say, you know, just don't even allow kids to be on social media or wait till they're, you know, well into high school. Um, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, and then <laughs> we also hear that social media is how kids connect, how they're making friends, how they get to know people in, you know, other countries, things like that. So, you know, it's a mixed bag, but I'd like to hear from each of you about just your take on how social media plays a role with mental health. And so, um, Courtney, we'll start with you. Um, you know, how are you seeing social media play a role in your clients? lives and their mental health, like, what are some of the trends you're seeing? Yeah, so I, the first thing that comes to mind is the misinformation that's on social media and how often I now have young people coming in and saying that they're, they have this diagnosis because they saw the symptoms from somebody on TikTok or Instagram and so they must have it. And um, like a little anecdote I can share is one time I had a client who sent me an infograph of, um, it was borderline personality disorder. They were like, I have borderline personality disorder, don't I? And it had like the little pictures with little symptoms on it. And I found an, inf an infograph of PTSD and it had almost the same things on it. And I sent that to them. Um, <laughs> Like we could we could talk about this uh, next session, but really like the, s there's so much language that's out there now, and it's amazing because we're able to put more words and descriptions to things. And I think young people are curious and they're trying to figure out like where they fit in or if there's a diagnosis, like how what do, what does that mean for them? And I think it's a lot harder to sit with like no, you experienced something and you're sad or you have been traumatized. You are like something, there's just 
yeah, the misinformation is is really difficult um, to navigate. And I guess at the end of the day, I'm always like an advocate for treating the symptoms and not the diagnosis anyways. Um, what does that mean like in practice? So in practice, it means that I'm not just going to do whatever the um, like something that is like, okay, this is the, or I guess looking at a client who is presenting with symptoms of depression, it doesn't need, we don't need to sit there necessarily, unless it's important to them, sit there and have a conversation about, you know, read off the DSM to them and let them know like what the symptoms of depression are, mm -hmm. but more so like, okay, you're telling me that you're experiencing these things and that's what we're going to work with. Like, how can we just, how can we address you know, this feeling of loneliness that you're feeling, this feeling of not wanting to wake up in the morning, not wanting to go to school, not being able to, um, you know, make decisions about things, like different problems that are sometimes life problems that everyone experiences and sometimes harder or more difficult. Um, but it's... I think that that works in my favor when I'm talk when I'm dealing with all the misinformation that comes into my office. Wow. And so, Doug, um, can you talk about some of the potentially negative effects of you know being on social media, or what types of social media create negative effects? Yeah, I think that's a whole other symposium. Oh, okay. <laughs> we could take to, no, I, I'll, I'll say something, but it, <laughs> it, it's there's so many components to it that I think it's, it's very challenging to say, you know, this this is, uh, is what's going on. C clearly, social media, many of them are built to be addictive, so there's intermittent reinforcement so that people want to engage. That's how um, they get all, all kinds of people to engage in it. And un unfortunately, that affects some people differently than others. Similar to substance use, there's some people that can experiment and they're fine, and there's some people that experiment and they're immediately addicted, and it's a, it's a lifelong problem. And so we don't have good ways of uh, talking to young people about, oh, you're going to be more susceptible to uh, being stuck on social media, and we have to put you know guardrails around what that means for you, whereas other people can pick it up and put it down and pick it up and put it down. So th that that's one of the challenges. Um, the the social component of adolescence that's like we're almost hardwired for is now happening in this um, digital space where there's bullying, where there's misinformation, where um, there's uh, there's just challenges in being able to perceive what's real and what's not real and, and how that's going to impact uh, the individual. Um, and th then it... The other side uh, is that it's useful, as you're saying. It's, it's a way that people connect. Uh, definitely during the pandemic, it was the way that people engaged and connected and uh, was very useful uh, as well. So it, it's, it's a, that's why it needs a whole symposium. Okay, yes. it's, it's, very, it's very complex. Um, and you know, try going to an adolescent saying, okay, I'm going to take away your account um, or you know, you know, I'm going to... Um, just make another one. Yeah, they'll just make another one. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, it's it's just very complex. Thank you. Yes, Madeline, go ahead. I, I just want to add that what's not as complex, I agree with you, of, of course, um, is, is the fact that 84% of the information on mental health on TikTok, which is now the single most used social media platform with 1 billion users, 84% of it is misleading. Um, and, and I think that's a big deal. And it's interesting, it's most misleading um, around bipolar, dissociative disorders, and I forget the third one, but... Borderline is a big... Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So, you know, and, and it's generic. The stuff on there is so generic. It's like um, how to tell if you have an anxiety disorder. Uh, you fidget. <laughs> You're a perfectionist. You know, you like to do things... I mean... that. It's, it's ridiculous, and the, 
the education that needs to go on for kids about how to process this information um, and, and how to tell if something's valuable or not. I was just looking at TikTok in prep for this. <laughs> and, and there's a guy that gets on. I have no idea what his training is. And he says, uh, are you in any pain? And of course, who wasn't in some pain? And he says, if you are, then you've been traumatized. And then you get to go down the whole road of trauma. So I am not as... I'm not cautious about it. I don't like social media. I s and I have a kid who lived on it, and now he's the director, and it was used incredibly well. So yeah, there are things like that, but the amount of misinformation around just in this specific area in mental health is mind-boggling. You should just get on for a half hour and put in mental health. The New York Times had a great article called High functioning anxiety isn't a medical diagnosis; it's a hashtag, <laughs> um, and that that was uh, ten days ago. Maybe it's worth reading or, or listening to. It's yeah. So that makes me think, though, that maybe kids are just looking for like a label or validation to say, like, why did I feel crappy last Thursday, or why do I throw up before an exam, or you know, like things that I guess. As adults, we might look back and be like, oh, that was totally normal to feel like that. Um, so how how can we find that balance of, you know, helping kids? Maybe, Courtney, you have some ideas of, you know, giving, you know, voice to something or giving, like, helping kids articulate what they're feeling without it turning into a hashtag. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, if they come to therapy, I think that's that's <laughs> what they'll get is like a way to articulate their feelings. Hopefully that's often the goal is like learning to identify emotions, process them, um, coping strategies like that's it's all like it. But that's the hardest part, right, is like going to therapy, getting into therapy, like asking for help when you need it. And, um and then the lack of services, so. Yes, and that, that's something that is a huge problem where, you know, I started noticing at the end of any show that had some sort of, like, character going through maybe suicidal ideation or something, right? At the end of the show, it always say, if you or someone you know is having, you know, is going through this, here's the 1-800 number, right? And all of a sudden, it's like there's 1-800 numbers, right? Now there's, is it, I'm blanking on the number you can call now for psychiatric. Um, is it 811? No. 998. Nine, nine, okay, yes. So now it, it feels like there's more places to turn. So, but can you all speak to, um, you know, what happens when families say, okay, you know, this child needs help or what does help look like? So can you each kind of talk about that from your perspectives? Um, there's not enough help by a long shot um, on a couple of boards where we're trying to get screening in schools and um, just a whole bunch of mental health services. And I'm very frustrated because you can screen in schools, but if 20% of kids have an anxiety disorder, you need to quadruple your, your, it's not your therapist, it's not in the pipeline mm. to be able to service that many people. So I think there needs to be another way to think about utilizing, this is just my own idea, utilizing people in the community who have a lot of contact with kids in some way, because there's just not enough, P you know, it takes seven years to get a PhD. There's just not enough people, or subsidizing, maybe for social work, I don't know, but, um, there's awareness of mental health issues, which, by the way, has not decreased mental health issues. So we have 800 numbers all over the place. We have uh, all of which I'm in support of. Mm -hmm. And we have um, public service announcements. And we have screening in the schools. And, and we have that it's OK thing where all these athletes and stuff get on and say, you know, I had depression <laughs> and it's okay, you can talk to someone. 
none of that has impacted the rate of um, mental health problems. And, mm -hmm. and I think part of that is because that's not how you impact those things, and there's not enough people to service people who need help. And it can be very expensive, too, right? Yes, okay, and so, um, you know, Doug and Courtney, you know, let's say you have a child or youth going through something. Um, is therapy usually the best option, or is it now, since we know there's just not enough therapists, are there other avenues for support? There are definitely other avenues for support. <laughs> uh, and Doug could for sure speak to this probably more than I could, but um, I don't know that I could do the work the work that I do without my team, which is we all at Huckleberry, all the therapists work embedded into different programs where we have case managers, directors, usually that's it, sometimes some other staff. Um, but the things that the case managers can do the support that they can provide is a lot different than what I can do. I have like ethical responsibilities to like uphold boundaries with my clients. So I can't always I can't always support them in the ways that I think that they should be supported. Um, but I, you know, I do the best that I can and I believe that I <laughs> I couldn't hold the caseload that I have if it wasn't for the case managers that also do work. And so I think that in that sense, uh, Huckleberry really has it right with the way that our programs are like are set up to provide support. And I will say not every, like we get, I get referrals all the time for youth who are not ready for therapy. They don't wanna do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody told them they had to do it. Somebody told them that they thought it would be best for them. And I think one of the worst things that you can do is force a kid to go to therapy because that kid is going to turn into an adult that hates therapy. And mm -hmm. when they finally are ready to get help, they're going to be like, oh, remember that time that I had that really bad experience because I was forced to go to therapy. And so I never want that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that there are other supportive roles um, in a lot of organizations across the city, across the Bay Area that do amazing things for youth. Uh, I was just sitting here thinking that there's, there's many ways to mental health. Um, we talk a lot about exercise as a way to treat depression. There's... Uh, it, it, helping others, do it, taking on some kind of community activity where you're giving to somebody else helps with depression. Uh, there was a study I read earlier this week that um, they did a one full day of cognitive behavioral interventions with kids, and six months later, they were still showed improvements. So there's many ways that we can intervene that's not just you know, 45, 50 minute, once a week uh, session. And especially for young people, I don't think we can underestimate that engagement with others um, and whether that's through sports or arts or or what. We want that to start at a much younger age and we're doing less and less of that as a community as well. That's where a lot of socialization and engagement with others um, happens and adolescence is easier if you've been socialized as a younger kid with others and you work out all those rules, you know, who. You know, what happens when somebody breaks a rule? And little kids can work that out. And if you haven't done that and learned those skills when you get to be an adolescent, it, it's much more challenging. But there's many ways to mental health, not just uh, psychotherapy. And uh, just going back, we have wait lists. We, we, we can't hire enough uh, therapists who are bilingual to serve the population that's coming just to us. And we're a small organization. That's multiplied many times just in the Bay Area and then in California and then across the world. I mean, there's just not enough um, people who can provide the services that are needed. And what is cognitive behavioral interventions? Can you talk about what those are? Sure, uh, cognitive behavioral uh, treatment works with the way that you think about things and the, um, 
the the process uh, there, there's various ways that the the it's applied I, I don't know the specifics of this one study that I was talking about I don't know what you would do for a full day but it's it's looking at um, teaching yourself to, to challenge your thinking so that it's not the automatic response that may be a negative response but that there's alternatives and one of the keys is having an internal dialogue about questioning whether that's the correct response that you should be having in terms of your thinking and um, then creating alternatives so that you don't get fixated and stuck in a way of thinking. Thanks, thanks for that. And you brought up the, you know, the term community, which we talked about in our previous discussions about this. Um, and so let's talk about more of the solutions or the antidotes to some of these issues that, that young people are having. And when we just talked about community, it was really, how do you build community, right? How do, you, how do young people access community when they're young, they're, <laughs> they're inexperienced? So can you each talk about that? Like, what do you think community means for young people and how can we help them build those? I think a really important part of that that we haven't touched on is that these rates of um, anxiety, depression, et cetera, are very high in teenagers. They're also very high in their parents. So it, I've been on a million panels about teenagers. Uh, I think a teenager does more or less as well as their parents are doing. And parents are out of community because everything has become about competition. And, you know, where's your child going to school and where did they get admitted? And um, we know that kids do worse when they believe that their parents value their success over their character. Now, the parents say, we don't do that at all. But the kids believe because there's so many under, you know, under the rug, uh, suggestions about what really matters in a family. So uh, I start with talking to the parents about where that community is. And with young kids, you bring them along. That might be the church or the shul or um, a service organization. But I was big as a parent of schlepping my kids along when I was delivering food. I think you have to role model community. And you have to talk to parents about re-engaging in community that is not about competition and the way we have defined success. My screed, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, um, I would say that we're much more divergent community than we used to be. I mean, there's a lot more... Um, people sticking with people that they're comfortable with and not engaging with people that they're not comfortable with. And we clearly see that in our politics, but I think even on a small level, we, we want to be comfortable all the time and don't want to be challenged anymore as, as adults. And I think that, that there's also a trickle down to that. I, and, and I think the pandemic was much more challenging on parents and adults than we think about. And still some of that like under the rug kind of stuff happened where I just remember thinking, what's gonna happen next week? What's gonna happen next month? Or is everything, is, is this the end of the week? And my kids can't help but pick that up. Um, even though I'm saying, yeah, yeah, this is, it's only a two week closure. You know, we're only closing down for two weeks. Knowing in my mind it's going to be a six-month kind of thing, and uh, you know, looking back to 1918 and trying to read all the news and figure out what's going, the the panic that I had must have uh, gone to my to my kids as well, and um, and and that's I, I think that's that happens more and more because of these diverse communities. We're not engaging the parents and the kids aren't engaging with people that are difficult to engage with anymore. Um, we're just trying to keep our space safe. And then we don't learn the skills and how do you negotiate and how do you, how do you tolerate things that are uncomfortable? How do you, um, how do you tolerate boredom? Um, these are the things we don't do anymore. We try to avoid all those, uh, all of that. And if we could do those things, we would have stronger, broader community. Yeah, that's, that's well said. I think I. 
I don't even know where to start sometimes when I'm talking with young people, my clients, about like that that part of their mental health, like engaging in community, being social, finding meaning and purpose, finding your people, like that's a lot of times uh, it feels like uh, secondary to the work that I do because a lot of these young people are just trying to get their basic needs met. Mm -hmm. And as much as I, as try to have conversations about um, community building and understand like what that means to them. There's such a, a lot of people, a lot of young people are still just in survival mode mm -hmm. and um, it's hard to kind of like be like oh do you want to join a soccer team like <laughs> <laughs> and so um I, it's a great question and I don't really know where we start I think San Francisco in general has like a lot of um a lot of great I don't know like activities events things that people can participate in that is different from a lot of areas, a lot of other more rural, rural areas, and still people aren't really going. They're, you know, they, like you said, they are comfortable with like what they're doing, who they're with. They don't really want, want a, another challenge, which makes sense sometimes. Uh, there's one thing I'd like to add to that, and that's that I think a sense of community starts in your home um, and the obvious answer of how you build a sense of community to me with children is they have chores and they, they understand totally that the house doesn't function unless everybody has something to do. And my, I have three grandchildren under the age of five now, but they take their dishes to the sink. I mean, I, that sort of thing I think is critical to understanding that you are needed as part of a community that the community, it, so it's small, it's micro as opposed to macro. Um, but I think it's super important and with the kids that I work with who are very different than, than the kids that you guys work with, every kid knows how to get out of their chores. It's after dinner and every kid I see knows they can say, oh, I've got a test tomorrow, Ma, and I gotta go <laughs> study. And Ma's like, don't work, Ma's been working all day. Ma says, don't worry about it, honey. I'll take care of the dishes. So, and I think that's a huge mistake. Tempting as it can be, I think it's a huge mistake. So I like the idea of kids having chores and making the family your first community. Thank you. And I have young children, and it's so hard to get them to do <laughs> anything. And I was that kid who would say, Mom, I have to do homework. And did not have to do a lot of housework <laughs> when I was growing up. But, do, but don't you think that that, that beginning of um, understanding that, that the house wouldn't function without your contribution lays some foundational groundwork for I gotta participate. You know, one of the questions you had was how do you get people to participate? Well, they have to be believe at age four that their part, you have little kids, that their participation matters. And I think as a working mom, that's a really hard thing. I've, and I think that's what's so different about right now is that all my kids, they both work, they're both exhausted, and so it's easier to say, I'll take care of the dishes. So it's short-term short gain, but, but long-term, I think I've made my point. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so I'm curious for you all in the audience. Um, yes, we can now turn to, to Q&A, but I'm just curious if any of you all are parents or look back on your own adolescence, like is anything we've talked about resonating or, yes? Living? Thank you. 
great point um, that you're making. You could make it that your house wouldn't function if they didn't contribute, like, where's dinner, Ma? Oh, you didn't go shopping today? I, I have for myself, but I don't know, you're on your own. I mean, I, th I understand that's a hard thing to do, but I, I think your point about expectation is really, really important. Thank you. So any other thoughts or questions in the audience? Yes, in the back. Are you talking about um, a, men a mental health crisis or a lack of rec cultural recognition of um, the fact that Chinese people have mental health issues? But does the... I think what I'm asking you, in terms of the work I have here in changing stressors uh, for kids to achieve, that became a huge cultural thing. So you had to have some acceptance of the culture, in the culture of the problem. And, and the only reason I'm asking you is my niece is a, runs a school in China. And she has said to me that uh, when people come in around mental health, they usually say, no, we don't have any problems. So is that accurate? Uh-huh. The first thing that kind of, kind of came to my mind is um, s like support groups or therapy groups, mental health groups. Um, I think for some people it can be easier when you're in a space that you see other people around you are going through something similar. And in my experience, as like a facilitator of groups, like the some of the best work that happens is when the people who are in the group are talking to each other and listening to each other, validating each other. 
And um, so I kind of feel like it wouldn't take too much training to facilitate a group. You can find like some kind of curriculum and just, and that could work with young people, with parents. We run a parents group that has um, been really great. And so I definitely agree that like parents need a lot of support and a lot of it does go back to like during, during the pandemic, the parents were struggling too. And I think still are. And are understanding like their own mental health needs better now maybe and also trying to understand how they can best help their children and so um and I guess that again that goes back to socialization community I think groups can be amazing and I, I would just add to that that maybe thinking about what are your sort of cultural assets what are the values in your community that do support mental wellness. You know, we talk a lot about like conditions and problems, but sometimes that overshadows some of the the things that we do have that do help us, right? And in some of my reporting, um, you know, specifically reporting on Latinx communities, and there was this group called Latinx Therapy, and they talked a lot about like, you know, we, we do come with resilience in our cultures and sometimes we just don't, we just oversee it. And sometimes it's about really thinking about what is it about our music, our poetry, our family values that do, that we can, you know, really emphasize, right? Like if you have parents who are so concerned about their child succeeding, but that child might not make it, that's, you know, the parents need to buy into that, right? Like, what is success? Like, is it your child being happy? Because when, if a child is happy, they're more likely to want, you know, to do better in school, right? So all these things kind of work together, right? So, but thank you so much for, for coming here and I wish you the best. It's a, it sounds like you're already trying to make some progress. So that's great. So yes. I know the hesitation is because bringing in programs <laughs> always costs money, <coughs> and um, and schools don't have a lot of money. So 
you know, I assume there's um, SEL. You do have a curriculum, and is the curriculum, and is it integrated across the curriculum, or is it uh, like a separate thing? So the research is SEL curriculum needs to be a cr cross curriculum, that it's not very helpful to have one teacher do it and somebody else not um, do it. And you know, that that's the, a good place to start because there's a tremendous amount of data behind that being helpful. Um, Socio-emotional learning, SEL, yeah. Um, hard. Well, yes. And can you, um, can anyone define restorative practices in this panel? Or I don't know exactly how I would define it, but I think in the simplest way, it is conflict resolution, but you're kind of teaching it to young people. I mean, it's used, you can use it in any setting. Um, but in schools, there has been a move towards using restorative justice, to s restore restorative justice practices to kind of like give young people the autonomy to solve problems before going to suspending and expelling and you know involving other systems that don't need to be involved. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's my little definition. Yeah, I don't know if we're gonna have a satisfying <laughs> answer, but I will say that when I was doing some reporting two years ago about California's mental health care spending. Um, Gavin Newsom made a big deal about how the state was going to invest $4 billion into mental health, um, whether it was services or training for people. Um, and a big piece of that was for schools because schools are seen as a delivery mechanism, right? I mean, kids go to schools and so if you want to help kids, you should, put mental health into schools in some way. Um, you know, at the time, there was a lot of big announcements about this money, but not a lot of specifics <laughs> on how it was going to be spent. So if there is maybe someone, it sounds like you're a pretty involved parent. Um, so if there's someone at the district who you could even ask, like, have you received any additional funding or what has that been used for? I mean, you may not get a great answer, but at least, you know, there is that question because politicians make a big deal about, you know, funding things, but not like afterwards. <laughs> so, um, but thank you. Thank you for your questions. Is there another question? Uh, yes, over here. <laughs> so there was this really big study that looked at, um, how kids perceive their parents' valuing of a whole bunch of different things, like I get good grades or I gave a quarter to being success-oriented, so success-oriented and character-oriented. And parents almost unanimously said, oh, of course, we value character over um, success, which was basically academic achievement. They all said uh, we'd prefer character. Their kids, many, uh, I gotta remember the percentage, 70% of the kids say my parents value uh, s success over character. And the rates of emotional problems of those kids, of depression and anxiety, were much higher than the kids who felt their parents valued character. And 
I just have this little personal anecdote. So I raised three sons, my oldest boy. One day he's in the house, and he's, we're Jewish. And he says to me, he's probably 16, he says, can't I be anything other than a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant? And I'm like, what? Like, I never said anything like that. Where did you get that from? And he went like this. You didn't have to say it, meaning where we lived, what our house looked like, who our neighbors were. So there's all of these, you know, subterranean, I guess, messages that come through about what's valued in a family. It's not just what you say. It's how your eyes light up when your kid comes home with the A and how you, your eyes get dull if it's a B minus or something. So. I think there was, what was striking about it was the difference between what parents thought they were promoting and what their kids felt they were promoting. Yes. I was going to say, th think of your childhood development stuff because I think it would be different based on the age of, of the young person. Um, and you would want them to be engaged in the process um, and not overwhelm them with, oh, there's going to be a disaster, so we have to be prepared for it. So there's a lot of titrating based on the age of the, of the person um, and they're also their personality it, you know some people are more prone to freak out if they think that there's a possibility of some major disaster and other people would be very interested in helping out and being part of the family and getting things ready and knowing where we're supposed to meet and so I, yeah I don't have a I mean it's not my expertise area at all but I, I don't have the answer except like I think development is, needs to be interwoven into whatever you do and when you say disaster, do you mean like a natural disaster? Or do you mean just any pretty major interruption in a child's life? I liked your point about um, titrating it because um, I'm sure you're doing great work. It's tough, but I think people are so scared now, and that's part of the bifurcation in the country. Is and and you know I've I've been in disaster drills for children. They make me crazy. Um, one, we know they don't do any good, and two, why would you have children have that kind of trauma? So I like very much your idea of talking with the kid. So if my grandchild, I would say, you know, what makes you feel good? But that's such a slippery line because everybody is scared now. Mass shooting, I mean, what these kids have grown up with is mind-boggling. You know, we used to 
have to hide under the desk in case Russia, I don't know, it's a nuclear war or something. That was nothing compared to the kinds of drills that a lot of schools do, so caution. <laughs> Maybe one last question since we're kind of over on time. Yes. Uh, during the pandemic, like, so I did mostly, I'm very active in Jewish family and children's service, so they did a lot of stuff. They delivered meals, they brought people to appointments, they just sat and talked to people who were alone. Um, some with Catholic services, but it, the, anything, you know, you have to think about what purpose is, like what makes something purposeful for a kid. And, you know, I did a lot of what do you like to do? What matters to you? I, it has to be goal directed. It has to be bigger than you. So it's not just what I thought was good for them. Um, some of them clean, clean the block of litter and stuff like that. Uh, but a lot of it was service-oriented, delivering meals or you know, talking to elderly people who had nobody to talk to, that kind of thing, yeah. And I, I wanted to say something to you. I saw you had your hand up. I don't know your name. The Priya. Um, one of the issues with schools, I think, is the dilemma. Uh, I was a teacher long before I was anything else. It is the hardest job in the world. It makes being a psychologist a piece of cake. It really <laughs> does. And so teachers are being asked to do more and more. Their pay is not especially good. I mean, there's a whole structural thing around what teachers can do and can be expected to do. Um, it's just a thought about you add more to teachers and they're, they tend to be resistant. Well, we um, have reached the end of our time, but I just want to say thank you to everyone for your questions, for being engaged. Um, it sounds like you all are bringing a lot of just real thoughtfulness and care to this issue. And, you know, it, like we keep saying, it starts with community, it starts with strong families to, you know, have strong individuals. And so hopefully you all took something away from this um, and feel free to hang out and ask questions. Um, we appreciate your time. So, Doug? Can I, yeah. Yeah. Well, you can clap, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, <woo -hoo>. um, <laughs> I, I also wanna say thank you to the panel and uh, thank you, Blanca, for moderating for us tonight. So, uh, Huckleberry Youth Programs is an organization in San Francisco and Marin County. We've been around 55 plus years and we talk a lot about community up here. We can't do what we do alone. So um, if you're interested in being part of our community, uh, let us know. If you'd like to donate to us to support some of the services that we do, that would be great too. Uh, huckleberryyouth.org, just huckleberryyouth, one word, dot org. You can donate or uh, engage with us or come up and talk to me afterwards too. But thank you all for being here um, and thank you again to the panel. Thank you.